Hi everyone, and welcome to our Migrating to Jetpack Compose Code Along. I'm Nick, and I'm joined by Manuel. Quick side note, I actually lost my voice two days ago, so I'm hoping I make it through this Code Along, but you've got a slightly husky Nick Butcher today. Uh, we're also joined by Jose Alferca and Nick Rao, who are in the YouTube live stream chat, answering your questions. So if you're watching live, then feel free to ask questions there. Now, Jetpack Compose is Android's new UI toolkit, and it's built to coexist and interoperate with the view system, making it easy to adopt at your own pace. There's no need to rewrite your apps from scratch. You can start by adding a single Compose element to your app. Today, we want to show you how you can start adopting Compose in your existing apps by live coding, migrating part of a screen from a view-based app. We'll go through the migrating to Jetpack Compose code lab. Feel free to follow along in Android Studio yourself or just watch. To get the most out of it, we recommend that you are familiar with writing Jetpack Compose, as we will focus on the migration and interop APIs today. If you're not, we recommend that you check out the Compose Basics code along. OK, so hands on now. Let me share the screen. Nick, can you see it? Yeah, I can see your screen. Great. So you can find the code lab either by searching for migrating to Jetpack Compose, or if you follow the short link, which is shown on the screen just below. OK, so this is the code lab that we're going to work through today. Uh, there's a number of steps, uh, and it will cover how to incrementally migrate your view-based app to Compose, how Android views and Compose can interoperate, and then finally, how to theme and test a hybrid application. So let's jump in at step two, planning our migration. So there are many ways that your team can go about adopting Compose. Uh, you can consider either writing new screens with Compose, leaving the rest of your app um, view-based, or you could migrate individual components to Compose and use them from within view-based screens. Or you could migrate entire activities or fragments. It's up to you and your team to pick the best strategy for your app. Today, we'll use a hybrid strategy where we'll start with a view-based app and migrate some elements to Compose. So what are we going to migrate today? We've created an app ready for you to work on. You can find the code in the Android Compose Code Labs GitHub repository. This repo contains code for all of our Jetpack Compose Code Labs. Today, we're interested in the Migration Code Lab. The Migration Code Lab is built on top of the Sunflower App, a simple plant tracking app that is currently written with views. There are two branches of this repo, main and end. If you ever want to see the final results, you can switch to the end branch. I already have Android Studio with the project imported and the emulator open and running the Sunflower app. Here, you can see our empty garden, and we can take a look at the plant list, where we can see plants like apple, avocado, etc. So for example, if I click on avocado, I can see the plant details. Today, we will migrate the information of the plant to compose the text that you see on the screen. That is the plant name, watering needs, and its description, nor the image or the fab. So how do you add compose to your app? Uh, this is already done in our project, but let's take a look at the build.gradle file to show you what you need to do to actually add compose support. So here we are in Build Gradle. And the first thing is the Build Features block, where we set the Compose support to true. What this does is it tells the Android Gradle plugin to add the Compose compiler extension, which is what Compose uses to generate code powering the Compose model of automatically re-executing your composable functions that you write whenever the app's data changes. Uh, going down to the dependencies, we can see there's a number of Compose dependencies for different functionality. For example, there's the Material Artifact, which contains all the UI components we're going to use, uh, as well as things like uh, UI tooling for providing Android Studio's preview support. So as we said, this is done in the project. But now you understand how to configure Compose, we can start using it. We'll start small, and we'll replace some views declared in XML with Compose functionality. To do this, we'll use the Compose view. This is a regular Android view that bridges from the view world um, into Compose. That is, we can create Compose um, within it. Um, even, we can create a Compose view even in XML or in code. And then it offers a set content method in which we can create Compose UI. So Manu, why don't you show us the views that we're going to migrate? They're using data binding right now, right? Yeah, that's correct. So we can go to the plant detail fragment, which is the entry point to the plant detail screen. And here we can see a bunch of things like using uh, view model, the plant detail view model to 
graphing information, application, application data to display on the screen and also perform some business logic. And in the on-create view, we can see it's using data binding to inflate this fragment plan detail XML layout. So we can see what it looks like. We can see it's using data binding, supporting some data. And a coordinator layout that is going to contain the app bar layout with a collapsing toolbar layout. We are interested in that. And with the nested scroll, uh, scroll view, this is going to give you that layout behavior. Inside, inside it, we're going to have this constraint layout, which is what's going to have the plant information. We will say it's uh, made of a bunch of text views. And this is what we are going to migrate. So we are going to select pretty much everything, uh, the constraint layout and its uh, content and its children, and we are going to comment it out. We are commenting it out because later we'll have to see how to migrate each individual text view to Compose. So to have, uh, as you were saying, to have a Compose content in here in an XML, uh, we can use the Compose view type, which is going to be a view type, and we can give it the same width and height of that of the constraint layout, so we can have a much parent. So to be able to reference this Compose view in the fragment, to be able to call Composable functions, we are going to give it an ID. I'm going to be ID and then going to give it Compose View, for example, because we don't have many other Compose Views in here. And as you can see, we are not passing in the margin. We are not declaring the margin in the XML. That's because we have to. We want to have Compose as the source of truth. And how, for example, later we'll see how to add that margin inside Compose. We don't want to tweak things in XML and then and Compose. Single source of truth, it's going to be Compose. So here we can go to our fragment and in the apply block where we configure our bindings, we can go to the bottom of it and here access compose view, which is basically we just created. And then here we can call the set content method, as you were saying, Nick, this is going to be the bridge from the view world into compose. So in its, in its Lambda, we are in compose land and we can call composable functions. So here we can have the material theme just to style our compose elements, UI elements. And inside here, we can call the plant detail description, which is going to be a composable function that we already have ready for you to, to work on. It's going to deploy this to the emulator. And we can see the plant detail description is going to have just a hello compose. And here we are just making sure that we configured compose properly. So in the emulator, what we need to see, or what we're going to see right now, it's going to be no plant information and just hello compose to make sure that everything is working fine. Cool. So while that's uh, building and deploying, uh, just a quick reminder, feel free to ask questions in the live chat uh, in the bottom uh, on YouTube, uh, and we'll be answering them for you. So it looks like that has redeployed and it's launching. And hopefully, mm -hmm. if you go to your plant list, we should see that. Uh, it's always good to see the hello compose text. It means that the build has been configured and everything's set up. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So let's go on to the next step. So now that we've kind of set everything up and got the plumbing in, let's actually migrate some of our um, UI. Well, once we convert the text view, which displays the plant's name and its layout and styling to the equivalent Jetpack Compose APIs. Uh, if you're looking for a list of UI components that are available for Compose, then check out the material modules reference docs, which list them all out, then you can look them up. So while converting our UI, Android Studio's preview function will help us to visualize what it will look like, which means that we don't have to always deploy our app or navigate to a certain screen to see it. Yeah, that's correct. So let's close the emulator and let's see what we need to migrate to Compose. Let me hear. So basically, it's going to be this text view, which is going to contain the, the plant name. We can see that it's configured uh, with some XML attributes that we will take a look. And the text, it's coming from the view model. Uh, it's going to be a model which is exposing the plant with live data and get the name. So that's going to happen in a later step. So we are not going to, not going to worry for that at the moment. So what we are going to do, we're going to have a composable and have a plant name. Cool. And so in the plant name composable, here I can also have, I can add the preview as you were saying before, Nick. So yeah, so I have the, the plant name here, sorry. And let's assume that we are going to get a name as a parameter. So here is going to be the plant name. And as you were saying, we, in, instead of a text view, we can have a text composable. So in the text composable, we can pass uh, the name. Cool. So OK, so as you were saying before, we don't need to actually redeploy every time and navigate to the proper screen just to see uh, how the plant name looks like on the screen. So for that, we can use this preview here. So let's create the preview with the material theme. 
and then we can call the plant name, for example, with something like avocado. And now uh, we can open the preview and to make sure that, oops, there we go, to make sure that everything is working fine, we might need to build and refresh. And while that's happening, which shouldn't take that long, we're going to see which XML attributes do we want to map to Compose. So the first one, actually, is that rendering? Yeah. So we can see that avocado appear here on the screen. OK, perfect. So OK, so back to our XML layout, we can see that we have some margin applied to the start and end, which is going to be 8 dps. But these 8 dps are coming from diamonds, uh, from the uh, diamonds.xml file. And this is going to be applying the margin small. And it's also going to center the text horizontally in the screen. And then we're going to give it some appearance. Cool. So back here, probably you know that we can style this text. We can modify it using modifiers. So we can have to give, for example, let's start with the margin. We can use the padding modifier. And padding uh, offers different overloads. You could you know, apply padding to all sides, horizontal, or start uh, you know, individual, uh, individual sides. So because we're interested in the start and end, we're going to use the horizontal one. And in here, we could actually uh, hard code it and say, you know, something like eight dps as we had in our in our XML layout. But since that information is already in the resources uh, file in the diamonds, we actually can reuse it. And the thing is that Compose offers a bunch of helper functions to to allow us to get information from resources. And in this case, the function that we need to use is the dimension resource function. We will see later that we have more of them. So we are going to do R uh, that we have to import, diamond, and from diamond, we can get the margin small. So that's basically uh, the way we you know, migrated kind of the margin from XML to, to compose. And the, the previous rendering, and we can see how it added <coughs> a bit of margin to the sides. Cool. Now let's see how we can center the, the item uh, horizontally on the screen. For that, we can use the uh, fill max width operator just to occupy as much width as we can on the screen. And then in addition to that, the grab content width uh, operator as well. And that's uh, going to take an alignment that we can say center horizontally. So that again, that's going to give us, going to occupy the whole screen, uh, the, the whole available size. Uh, the width and then gonna be centered that on the screen. Cool. So we can see that run fast and we can see avocado center. Lastly, what we need to do uh, apart from the text that will that will come later, it will we need to set the text appearance to headline five. And we can go here to the text composable and see the uh, function signature. We can see that it takes a takes a text that we already set, modifier, color, font weights, uh, and the one that we're interested about, you can see there are a bunch of them. The one we're interested about is about this style, the text style. So we can actually set the, the style of the text, and we can grab uh, different uh, uh, styles from the typography that is available in Material Theme. So in here, we can access and see the type typography offers a bunch of, of different ones, and in this case, we're interested in H5 in heading five. And so with that, I think uh, in the review, in the preview refreshes, we can see the text a little bit larger here on the preview. Yeah, oh, there we go. Okay, okay. now it's larger. Cool. It. Okay, I think we are ready. We migrated the cool. plant name to compose. Right, and we've got a couple of questions coming from the live stream. Let's take them here on, on the stream as well. So Dimitri asks, what about the performance when we embed Compose in XML? Uh, it should be like good, right? Basically, Compose View is a regular Android view and participates. And, you know, that's how we get uh, all the layout information and the you know events coming through and pass it through into Compose Land. So it's doing some stuff. It's adding some overhead, but Compose itself is also very performant. Like we've the layout model itself and the fact that we don't need to inflate XML um, is very performant. So the goals of the Compose system is to be like as performant, if not better, than the view system. So if you ever find any situations where we're not hitting that, then we consider that a bug. So please file file issues if you're seeing performance degradations like this. Um, so should be good, um, very much a goal, uh, if not better, um, than the view system. 
Another question has come in from the live screen asking if you can progressively migrate to Jetpack Compose. Absolutely, yes. This is what we're doing right now. So um, having changed, you know, a text view into a Compose view is kind of how we consider you can like take your first steps in Jetpack Compose by just adding a single component. That's kind of where we're up to right now. And the goal is that you can, you know, adopt it at your very much your own pace, a bit like the move to, to Kotlin where you can, you know, add a single file. Um, we think we've taken the same approach with Jetpack Compose. Cool. I think that was the questions we got coming in for the live stream. So let's go on and continue on with the code lab. Mm -hmm. um, right. So now we can render a plant's name, and but we want to actually hook it up to our app state rather than showing static data. So this screen's view model loads data and prepares it for display. It exposes a live data of the plant to display, which the UI can then observe. Now we can easily consume this in Compose, which offers functions for observing streams of data like flows, Rx observables, or live data, and converting them into Compose's ob observable type, which is called state. So for example, we can use the observe as state function, which observes the live data. And then whenever this value changes, any composable function which reads that state will then be re-executed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. So here we can go to the plan detail fragment. And if we go to the top, we can see that it's using the plan detail view model. It's grabbing it. And if we take a look at the view model, we are seeing it's just a very classic view model that is grabbing application data, for example, the plant from the repo, from the data layer. So that plant is going to be exposed as a live data. So it is true that we, we can uh, grab instances of the view model <coughs> of the body of a composable function. But uh, just to avoid the hassle of it, because it requires a factory and all that, because we already have the instance of the view model in the fragment, we can pass it to the composable function, and that's it. Like We don't have to do anything else. We already have it available. So we are going to add that as a parameter to the plan detail description. And here, uh, I wouldn't worry about memory leaks or anything like that, because the plan detail view model, the view model has a longer lifespan than the fragment or the composition. So we should be fine in that sense here. OK, so now that we have the plan detail view model in Compose, what we need to do is to grab the current plan, uh, that of the, the one that exposes the live data. So for that, we can imagine that we should have something like the current plan in a variable. And that plant is going to come from the plan detail view model. So as Nick was saying before, like we need something to convert from that stream of data to Compose's state API. And we need that uh, just to be able to recompose this function whenever this plant changes. And for that, we have the function observe a state. And actually, we can jump into the implementation of observe a state because we are not passing in a state value. It can return. It's going to be a nullable type. And you can see that it creates a state that is going to be returned with remember mutable state of, so nothing new here. And then the live data, it's going to be, uh, it's going to have this observer that on every new value, it's going to set the value of the state to whatever it receives. So this is how uh, the composable function is going to be able to recompose because we are mutating this state here. So that's a pretty easy implementation. So the idea here is that, for example, to not uh, access the value of the state every time, we can use the property delegates with the by keyword. So now we can use uh, current plan. Uh, we can guard against uh, the nullability with the let block here in Kotlin. And inside here in its body, we are going to see a non-null plan. So with this, we can move this up. And instead of calling hello compose, what we want to, to display is the actual plant. So we can say plant name, we can call it like that, and then access the plant.name like this. OK. So one of the problems with this plant detail description function is that it is coupled to the plant detail view model, which makes it hard to reuse in other parts of the app. The other problem is that it, is, it contains mutable states, that is the current plan, and it takes the view model as a dependency. It is, it is also very hard to preview. The solution is to create an additional composable function that just takes what is required to display a plant on the screen. So, and that's here. We can take this function here, or this piece of the function, we can extract it out to a different function, and we can even call it in the same way. We can call it a plan detail description. And so in here, we can have it like this. 
And you can see that here we have plan detail description that yet just takes what it needs, the plan name. And because it doesn't contain any mutable state, we can say that this function is stateless. And this other function that contains mutable state, we can say that is stateful. And so as we were saying, the benefit of the stateless function is that it's easier to preview and it's more reusable. And it's reusable because you just need to, to call uh, pass a planting. You don't need to pass the, the plan detail B model. But the benefit of the stateful version is that it is opinionated. And it's because it's opinionated, it's going to be easier to call, for example, from the plant detail fragment. And so it is a good balance to, it's a good practice to provide this balance, right? Stateless and stateful just to have that flexibility and use what you need uh, at the moment you need it. So we're going to go and create a preview for plant detail description because right now you just need to, pl to pass a plant, the plant that you want to preview. So let's come here and say plant detail description. A uh, preview, we can pass in uh, as before the material theme, and now we can call the plant detail description with the plant. Which plant? It could be something fake that we create. So here we have our, we can create a fake plant with avocado and the rest of information. And that's what we can pass into the, to the preview. So here, if we open the preview, uh, we can click uh, build and refresh, and we can see that now we can see the new preview on the screen. And now it's so much easier to change the, the fake plant or to use something different because this is now uh, the very reusable. Cool. So we can see the new preview here on the screen. And cool. Just to actually, like, this is the mock that we are going to migrate. We are going to migrate the plant name, the watering needs, and the information. Let's go ahead. Uh, and here we can imagine that we are going to have the watering uh, needs, and then we are going to have the plant description. And this is going to be uh, centered vertically on the screen. So what we can do is uh, use a column for that. So we can do Alt Enter, surround with widget, and we can do surround with column. And actually, what we've done here it's what we can we, what we had before in the construct layout. This is going to be kind of the outer container, and now we can add the the margin that we missed before. So I'm going to do I'm going to copy this modifier here, and I'm going to add it to the to the column. So we're going to do, uh, we're not going to be uh, this, uh, the modifier for the column is going to be applied to all sides and it's going to be margin uh, normal. And then we want it to occupy uh, the max width as well. Okay, so basically we just migrated pretty much what we have in the constraint layout to have the outer container here in the column just to be able to iterate uh, quicker through the code lab. So modifier for max width, uh, some extra padding. And now, uh, next steps are going to be migrating the watering needs and the plant uh, the, the description. So now, here we can see how the preview also updated. Cool. I think we are ready to go. Cool. Uh, a couple more questions come in from the live screen. So let's uh, see. So David asks, uh, why are the functions uppercase? You might have noticed that, that unlike kind of regular Kotlin functions, which are Camel, Pascal case, I always forget, lowercase starting with. Um, we tend to, this is a, actually a Kotlin idiom that um, we borrowed for Compose, which is when you have kind of like a factory function which constructs an item, um, then they recommend to use this this kind of uppercasing. Um, it's used in some of the coroutines um, APIs, I believe. Uh, and so we actually borrowed this because you should consider these composable functions are basically like factory functions for creating these UI objects. Uh, and as such, we give them um, this kind of uppercase naming. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that comes in from Jeff of like, do we need to migrate styles to compose to use them, or are styles already defined? Can we use styles already defined in XML? Uh, maybe we should save that one. We're going to get to that one a little bit later on, but it's a great question. So you're thinking ahead there. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Should we carry on with the code lab, Manu? Um, yeah. Right. So, so far, we've hooked up our UI to our um, view model, to our application's data and state, and we started converting some views. So we converted the plant's name, and we put in the layout container as well, the column, um, to replace the constraint layout. Um, let's see if we can quickly build up the UI using Compose's layouts, modifiers, and styling APIs, and how we can um, interoperate with more of the resources uh, system. Yeah, so what we're going to do now, it's pretty much uh, showing the mock again. It's going to migrate the watering needs, and this is what we're going to do in this step. OK, so for that, um, we can create something we can call uh, plant watering, for example. Uh, we can call this function. 
And as our mock say, we are going to have a, a column again, because the, these two texts are going to be displayed uh, vertically on the screen. So we're going to have the text, say, what it needs for now, and then something like every X days. So this is pretty much what we need to do now. Uh, and actually, let's call it from here, from the parent one. OK, so plant watering. Uh, so let's go back to the XML, because we are doing like a migration from XML layouts mm -hmm. to, to Compose. Um, just to iterate uh, on this quicker, uh, let me split the, the screen and move the, the XML down. Uh, cool, so this is going to be plan detail name. OK, plan uh, header. This is the text view we co which corresponds to the watering needs. So same as before, uh, so we are going to have uh, a start, top, and an end uh, margin small and then margin normal. So I'm going to copy again this modifier here. So the, the text uh, for the watering needs is going to have uh, the modifier with horizontal margin small. Uh, we can copy that, and then we are going to apply the margin normal, which is going to be applied to the top. Uh, OK, center horizontal. Um, I mean, this is going to be applied to both texts. And actually, we can make use of, of something that column has, which is something that is a parameter, which is the horizontal alignment. And in the horizontal alignment, we can say center horizontally. So every children of the column is going to be centered horizontally. We don't have to specify that in every single child. Cool. So that's going to be in there now the text is going to be uh, watering its prefix. And this actually comes from the strings.xml file. So we actually don't have it hard coded here. As I was saying before, Compose offers methods to access resources. And similar to dimension resource, we have the string resource function, which is the one that we are going to use, right? So our string and then the watering needs prefix. OK, another XML layout here, the attribute, the text color. As we saw before, uh, the text composable has this parameter color to specify what we do. And we can get the colors from, from the material theme. So we can do material theme, colors. And we don't have the accent per se, but we can use the primary variant in, in, in our material theme in Compose. Textile, uh, so XML attribute, we can use the font weight instead in Compose. So here, we're going to use font weight bold. And that's it. That's going to be pretty much uh, the, the watering needs, uh, the header. And now let's move on to the every X days, which is going to be the text view below that one. Cool. So as we can see, center horizontal, we've already done that. That's specified in the column. And then we can also see that it has the same margin, the start and the end. And just to avoid duplication, we are going to remove it from the text composable, from the one above, and we are going to add it to the, to the column. Because you know if the modifier is going to be applied to the column in that sense, it's going to be applied to, to both children. So here we can remove this. Uh, let's do a little bit of cleanup. Recap. Uh, so recap, we are passing the modifier, the padding on the sides to the column. And then the padding top is going, only going to be here in the, in the text and the first test composable. OK, OK, what else, what else here? Uh, both of this is done. And now the only thing is now it's setting the text to the, to the second text composable. And the text is set here in this watering text. And watering text, uh, let's search for that in the project. What is that? OK, so we can see that it's a binding adapter. This is one of the features of data binding. Uh, it's uh, taking a step view, uh, a text view, sorry. So it can be applied. This binding adapter can be applied to the text view. And what it's doing is that given a watering interval, it's going to call this get quantity string function from the resources. And in there, depending on the integer value, it's going to uh, have one string or the other on the screen, depending on the plurals. So basically, what we need to do is pretty much copy this behavior from the binding adapter and have the same in Compose. So let me copy this and put that here above uh, the every X space. So water in interval is actually uh, something that comes from the plant. And that's something that we can pass as a parameter here in the plant watering. So just to come here where it's called, we can say that the watering interval is going to come from the plant. 
So we can call plant watering. And now it's like, how do we get the resources? Do we have to pass them as a parameter as well, the same way as we are doing with watering interval? Well, the thing is that in Compose, um, there is a way to implicitly pass dependencies to composable functions using something called composition locals. You can read more about it in our docs, but we've already been using them. To access colors or typography from the material theme, we didn't have to declare it explicitly as a parameter. It was already available to us. And that's because material theme uses a composition local under the hood. And there are some Android specific classes such as the context or configuration that are also available. So to get the context of our host view, we can use the local context config, uh, composition local. So in here, in our uh, composable function, we can say local context, we can access its current value, and from it, we can access the resources. So we don't need to pass this explicitly as a parameter. And that's it. Like implicitly, the local context is going to be available to us. Uh, I'm going to refresh the preview. And the local context is going to be obtained from you know, the context of the composed view, which in this case is going to be that of the, of the fragment. So the preview is refreshing. <clears throat> and now we can see that we can see what it needs. And I think what we need here is to try to fill the, the max width. Uh, filling the max width is try to occupy as much space as possible. And then we should have it uh, centered, completely centered on the screen. Cool. There we Perfect. Go. Look at that. Cool. So, so far, we've looked at how we can embed Compose within views. But sometimes you actually want to do it the, op the exact opposite. Uh, perhaps you have a custom view that you've developed that you're not quite ready to convert to Compose just yet. Um, or perhaps you're just displaying a view that you don't own, something like a web view or a map view, or perhaps displaying an ad. Now, Compose offers APIs to do just this. We can use the Android view composable. Now, in our app, we want to display some text, which is stored as HTML. Compose doesn't currently have APIs to display HTML markup, uh, but we can use an Android view instead um, within Compose to display a text view from the view system, which does support this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we can actually open again the fragment plan detail. And this is the last, the last text view that we need to migrate today. And just to give you an idea of what's happening, I can open the render adapter, uh, render HTML, which is going to be another binding adapter. Um, here, this is what's happening currently in the view system. Uh, the, the text is set with this uh, static call to HTML compact that it returns a span type. So the thing is that, as Nick was mentioning, Compose doesn't offer a composable function to display HTML markup. And the text composable doesn't accept uh, the span type, just string. So what we need to do just to work around this is we are going to embed a text view inside Compose. So let's go here to our Compose code and create another composable function. And let's call it plan description, for example. And this is going to take uh, the description that we assume it's going to be in HTML uh, as a parameter. So here, let's uh, call this from, from our uh, main function. Uh, the description, it's going to come from the plant. And that's it. OK, so that's uh, already set. So the API to embed uh, view types inside Compose is called Android View. An Android view is a composable function. We can see the signature, and it takes a bunch of parameters. Factory, which is going to be a block that is going to create the view type. And then update. An update is going to be that callback or the block of code that is going to be executed after the layout is being inflated. So in our factory, uh, what we need to do at this point, uh, as you can see, it's provide us a context a context with which we can create uh, the, the view type. And in our case, we want to create a text view. So we have text view, and we pass in the, the context. And in the update Lambda, uh, you can see it's giving us the text view. And the text view, we want to get it populated with this, uh, with the text uh, so back here. So we can do text view, uh, there we go, dot text. Uh, HTML compat from HTML. So pretty much we copy pasted what we have in there. So quickly we can see that the preview, if it refreshes, uh, 
it's going to also show some HTML markup on the screen that coming from the fake plant. The fake plant already contains some HTML markup that we can see here. It's going to be HTML, a couple of lines, and description. Cool. So that's working as we expect. And now we need to, to tweak uh, what's happening. So just to finish off with the binding adapter, we can see that it's setting this movement method to, to be link movement method. And that's what's going to analyze the, the HTML uh, markup and, and recognize links that you can click on the, on the screen, on your app. So here in the apply block, whenever we create the text view, we can set the movement method. So to, uh, in our XML, we can see that we have here margin start top and end with margin small, and then we have a mean height. But let's do uh, the, mar the, the margin first. So in here, we are going to use the, the padding. Uh, the top padding It's going to be uh, small in this case. Yeah, it was small. And then we can duplicate it again and have the, the horizontal one. So we are going to have a uh, margin small to the top and the sides. Cool. Uh, for the mean height, which is going to be this planted description value, we can use the height in modifier uh, because for this, we can give it uh, a minimum value. So we can going to get the value again from diamonds and we have it there. And, and that's pretty much it. I think we are ready. I think let's run the app. I mean, that's probably my bad. We, we, haven't, we haven't run the app since the Hello Compose. This is going to be <laughs> uh, a little bit uh, of a shame. It's because if the preview's been properly. so good, we haven't needed to. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the reason. OK, so it's installing now. Uh, and we can come here and to the plant. And we can see uh, in Avocado, that pretty much is similar to here to our uh, actually the text in the description is a little bit small uh, we need to fix that but you can see that if we uh, uh, click on wikipedia it's actually going to open chrome this is what the, the movement method is doing uh, okay so what's happening with the uh, uh, text size okay so it's this style from text appearance medium uh, but actually at this point we are not styling Compose. We are just styling the the text view that we can do with the the text view compat set text appearance. We can pass in the text view and then call our style and text appearance medium. Okay, so that that's supposed to fix uh, that that really small text and we can make it larger. Okay, so this is redeploying and now we should see the larger text on the screen. And I think that's pretty much it. Uh, probably the only thing that you saw is that theming doesn't work properly at the moment, but that's something we're going to cover in a sec. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, cool. The text is larger. Perfect. Looking good. Uh, OK, let's check in on the live stream. There's a couple of questions come in. One interesting one uh, asks, uh, says that they think that XML readability might be more efficient than Compose, where the XML was exclu exclusively responsible for the UI as opposed to the Compose way. Um, Interesting question. Like perhaps in some cases that that could be it. We're looking at some pretty simple views here, a couple of text views. But um, I've actually found that um, Compose can be actually really efficient for understanding. And I, I think for a few reasons. Um, firstly, XML never really tells the whole story. I found that you know you declare your views in XML, but then there's always some code that kind of like inflates that and hydrates it and actually adds the data to it. So I don't think it's really fair just comparing it just to the XML because it's never just the XML on its own. It's always the combination of XML and some code behind it, um, which is updating or you know hydrating the UI, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think that's where Compose shines because you're not having to do, go through these mental hurdles of like context switching between them. It's all literally in one place, and you have the full power of Kotlin to kind of do control flow and um, you know conditional state logic and statements. It's exceedingly um, efficient at that. I think. Another massive win, I think, for Compose for me um, is type safety. Like XML is kind of like loosely typed, and you know, if you've ever tried to set attributes on a on a view and been frustrated that they, you know, don't necessarily apply, mm -hmm. that just isn't a problem in Compose because we can use the Kotlin um, APIs to build type safe APIs. So that um, you know, you might have seen Manu setting some particular modifiers on um, different components. We use kind of scopes um, to make sure that uh, those modifiers are only provided in places where they make sense. So it's actually a compile mm -hmm. error to try and use a modifier which doesn't make sense on a particular element. Um, so I think there's actually yeah. a lot of things going on in Compose. Sorry, Manny, yeah, go for it. 
Yeah, just to, to add a little bit on top of that, it depends on the kind of uh, compose code that you write. Because if like if you follow best practices, that actually is supposed to be not very hard to read. So you can see that, for example, here, one of the best practices is just to pass to composables what they need. And you can see that in, for plant name, plant watering, and plant description, we are, we are not passing the whole plant. We are just passing the, form the information that it requires. And for example, if you check plant name, you can see that it takes a string and that's it. And apart from that, everything is going to be UI styling. So it depends on how you structure your code. We, you know, the good thing is uh, because composable functions are reusable, that uh, if you follow best practices, you are going to see that reading compose code is really easy. And that's actually, you can see here that you have a surface with a column and inside the column you have three things. It's very easy to read versus in the, if you check out the, the commented, co commented out code here, you can see it's more difficult to see what's going on on the screen. So it could be true in some cases, but in general, I think compose uh, wins in this case. I think we could probably talk on this topic the, the entire rest of the stream. So uh, maybe we should leave it there. Uh, so continuing on with the code lab. Like, so, so far we've converted some of you, but um, by default, a compose UI is um, disposed when the view which holds it is detached from the window, but you can configure this behavior. So for example, the UI we've been converting is currently displayed within a fragment, but a fragment's view uh, can actually remain visible for even while the fragment, uh, sorry, even when the view is detached. Uh, so for example, if you're uh, running window transitions, the view may remain visible on screen even though it's been detached from it. Now, Compose lets us configure how you can um, set the lifetime of the composition if you need it to match a different um, life cycle than the default one of being uh, between on attached and detached from the window. So Manu, mm -hmm. how do you do that? Yeah, so actually I'm going to show you why that happens. And if we go to the navigation graph, we can mm -hmm. see that we are running transitions, enter and exit transitions on the uh, plant beetle fragment. So as you were saying, um, in the emulator, we cannot see that very well. But uh, you can see that we have an enter transition and then an exit transition. And the, the, the default value, uh, the default behavior of Compose, as you were saying, is that the, the composition is going to be disposed when the, the window is being detached from, from the Compose view. And in this case, while running the, tra the transition, while the transition is running, the, the window is detached. But you can see the fragment still visible on the screen and the transition happening. And that could happen, like the, the emulator is very slow and we cannot see that in action, but probably with a real device we could see, is that whenever the transition is happening, because the composition uh, it's you know removed from memory, you're going to see an empty screen. You're going to see the, the composed view being blank because the composition was uh, removed. And to avoid that, what we need to do is hook the life cycle of the composition with that one of the fragment view. And we have APIs to do so. And the API, it's in the compose view itself. So we can say compose view, and it's the set view composition strategy. So in, inside here, we can see the different options that we have. Uh, say view composition strategy, and then we have the dispose on detached from window. This is the default one. This is the one that we don't want for fragments, for dialogue fragments, or for, for example, compose views that are going to be items in a recycle view. The alternative is the dispose on view tree lifecycle destroyed. And this is one that we can use in our fragment, which is going to follow the, the lifecycle of the view tree. And then the other option is going to be the dispose on lifecycle destroyed, which takes a lifecycle or a lifecycle owner. So we could use the view lifecycle owner of the fragment to, to match what we are expecting for the composition to follow the fragment view lifecycle. But sometimes you don't know which lifecycle owner to use or which lifecycle to use. So it is safer if you use the dispose on view tree lifecycle destroyed. This option is going to automatically give you the, the right behavior. The other one is if you want to have more customization, if you want to really nail it and have some other or different you know, behaviors that you want to have. Or it's an interface, right? So you can write your own composition strategy as well. Exactly. Cool. Uh, any live questions and no more coming in just yet. So yeah, remember, feel free to put your questions on the chat. Mm -hmm. OK, so we've migrated some of our UI to Compose, but you might have noticed uh, that it isn't quite following our app's theme. 
some elements were purple that I noticed. They're not following the app's green theme. Now, that's because so far we've just been using the default material theme. We haven't set up any theming information in Compose itself. Now, we could do this, um, but this would actually duplicate the source of truth, leading to having to have two places to maintain our styling information. Instead, what we're going to do is something quite useful in this kind of hybrid application situation is we're going to use a library we've created called the Material Theme Adapter. And what this does is it converts an XML theme into a Compose theme. So this is great for the hybrid situation, as it means you have this single source of truth. Um, one thing to note is it's a one-way bridge, really. It can uh, basically read the theming information present uh, at the current context uh, in, in, the, in the view tree and turn that into a Compose um, theme. It won't go the other way. So if you were to put any Android views under inside your Compose hierarchy, it wouldn't go the other way. The reason is that the XML theming system is um, created at compile time. You can't create them dynamically, so the library isn't able to create these themes at runtime. But we can do it for you the other way, because Compose lets you do dynamic theming at runtime. So we utilize that in order to read the current theme information from XML and turn it into Compose theming. Yeah, cool. So let's do that. So mm -hmm. if we take a look at the build of Gradle file, the library that Annie uh, was mentioned is this one, the Compose theme adapter. You can find it here. And the idea is here is we need to replace all instances of material theme for MDC theme. And MDC theme, it's uh, actually what's going to uh, you know, read all that. So let's quickly go. We are using the material theme in there and in our previous. So while the, the project is compiling and all that, MDC theme, it's going to read the colors, typography, and everything from the current context. Uh, and that's what's going to you know, be displaying. Uh, and it's the theme that is going to be creating in Compose. And here we can uh, see that it's going to read the colors, for example, from styles.xml. So here we have the defined uh, all our colors. And these are the ones that it's going to be using. So we can see, like, for example, here in our preview, it already updated it with the green color that we were expecting. Ah, that's better. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And something that we can do is that uh, it doesn't only read light themes, it also works for dark themes. So we can actually uh, have the preview uh, for to do uh, the, the dark mode. And that we can do that with configuration, UI mode, night, yes. And now we can see we're going to create a duplicate uh, preview here with the same pretty much function. And you can see that it also works. MDC theme also works for dark theme uh, as opposed to light theme. If you didn't catch that, that was one of my favorite features of the preview is that you can duplicate the preview annotation and have multiple previews. So for this one preview function, it's going to stamp out multiple previews in the preview pane, which is pretty cool. So you can actually you know, work on light or dark or font scaled versions of the application simultaneously. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And another thing is that if you tap on the preview functionality, it actually will swap between them, for example, here to the uh, plant name preview. So that's, that's pretty neat. You don't need to scroll all the way to the previews. Well, that was easy, uh, switching our theming over. Yeah. Um, so and the last step in the code lab we want to take a look at is testing. So after we've migrated parts of the plant detail screens to Compose, well, you want to make sure that we haven't broken anything. So we want to make sure our tests still pass. So the app currently has UI tests written using Espresso. Um, we can update these to use Jetpack Compose's um, testing APIs instead. Now, Compose provides um, its own testing API and a testing rule for, uh, which allows us to host Compose content and then have some finders to find items within it and run assertions against these elements. So how does this look like, Manu? Cool. So we can close this one. Uh, so the plan detail fragment, we can see that it's going to have uh, its uh, counterpart test class. So here we have the plan uh, detail fragment uh, test. And let's run it and see what's happening after the migration. Just to give you a tour through the, through the test class, it's going to have an activity scenario rule. It's going to have uh, a before method that before every test is going to jump to the plan detail fragment using navigation. And then it's going to have a test uh, to check that the plant, uh, the plant name is visible on the screen. And another test uh, to check that the shared intent is fired. Uh, because you know you have the share intent, and then it's going to open the the share sheet, uh, share sheet, uh, and all that. So tests are running, but the test plan name failed, 
And that's because the test plan name is using Espresso APIs, but now we convert it from the text view to Compose. So instead of Espresso, we need to assert for the name using the Compose Testing APIs instead. And the API that we need to use for this hybrid uh, screen, it's going to be the uh, Create Android Compose rule. And that one, let me close the monitor for a second. It's going to you know, take the activity as well, uh, here the garden activity. And this API, it's you know, a wrapper on top of the activity test rule that is going to allow you to test Compose uh, code as well. So instead of activity test rule, we can call it a compose rule. And here we were using the activity test rule to, to get uh, into the activity. But the compose rule also allows you to get a hold of this one, of the activity rule. So nothing changes here. So we're saying like uh, activity rule is contained inside this compose rule. Cool. So now we need to migrate this test from uh, Espresso APIs to compose testing APIs. And we have a bunch of documentation about testing in Compose. We have talks, uh, we have uh, code labs, we have documentation. We have also a cheat sheet with information about different assertions, how to search for things on the screen. So I recommend you to check out the, the docs. Uh, and here we are going to practically say, OK, on node with text, we want to this, uh, find the apple, as we had before. And then the assertion is uh, assert is displayed. And that's pretty much it. This is Compose Testing APIs in action. You can see that it has a similar syntax to Espresso, uh, but you know a little bit shorter. So now we can run our tests again and see what happens. So you can see that we have uh, we can have uh, okay, uh, this is running at the moment. You can see that uh, test plan name is using co Compose Testing APIs. But also we have the test sharing text intent test that is using Espresso APIs. And not only that, uh, you can have, you can see that the test plan name uh, passed and the other uh, test um, has also passed. And in the same class, you can have uh, the functions using Espresso, functions using uh, Compose Testing APIs, but also you can have both of them, Espresso APIs and Compose Testing APIs working together on the same test. And that's because Espresso uh, has an idling resource to wait for Compose to be idle. So you can miss and match both of them, and they can interoperate together perfectly. With that, I think we migrated the screen to Compose, part of the screen at least. <laughs> Perfect. A uh, question is coming in uh, on the live chat mm -hmm. saying, is it possible to write a test for a single composable function rather than for the whole fragment or activity? Uh, yeah, very much so. In fact, um, I think that's something that Compose actually makes a lot easier to kind of mm -hmm. decompose your tests and actually have smaller units under test. Um, in fact, this is probably like one of my favorite things about the the preview and the stateless composables we talked about previously is that they kind of actually make your composables much easier to test. Like the stateless, the idea of a stateless composable, not only is it easier to preview in that you know it makes its dependencies ex exceedingly clear uh, exactly what it requires, uh, and a bit, a bit like dependency injection, rather than ever reaching out, it makes you pass them into it. This actually makes a lot of your um, composable um, functions much much easier to test, and that you can pass in um, fake dependencies. And, and and test them. Uh, another favorite thing, I'm quite a fan of the testing APIs, is it actually also makes it easy um, to do some kind of screenshot testing as well. Uh, you've got to do a bit of legwork for you. Um, we've seen some frameworks being built up about this, but you can actually also um, capture capture screenshots or bitmaps of um, the unit and have that run a comparison against a golden, for example, in order to catch any, any regressions on those single items. Um, anything you want to add to that, um, Manu? Oh, all good. That was pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually something that we, we very much enjoyed when we were developing Compose. In fact, we have like, you know a, a lot of tests of all of the individual components that we create, and we've caught regressions and bugs and things by running these um, regression suite against our um, entire um, UI library. So yeah, mm -hmm. big fan of that. Cool. Uh, I think that's it from the live question. So congratulations. We've worked our way through the migrating to Jetpack Compose um, code lab. 
so in which, like just looking back, we recovered we covered how to incrementally migrate views, a view based app to um, start using Jetpack Compose. Like like we said, you don't have to throw away your existing app. You can go piece by piece at your own pace and migrate just the views you want to use. Uh, we showed how Android Views and Compose can interoperate, how Views can host Composables and vice versa, how Composables can host Views and how you can interoperate using the resources system uh, and so on. And then we also showed how to theme and how to test a hybrid application. Uh, but there's so much more that you can do in that right, Manu. Yeah, so in this code lab, we migrated part of an existing screen to Compose. But if you check out the Compose branch of the original Sunflower GitHub repo, you can see that we have the full screen migrated to Compose. And you can see the image is going to be loaded with Compose. And we have animations to simulate, uh, to simulate that uh, collapsing toolbar behavior and much more things than that. And also, uh, also, we have the Compose pathway where you can find a lot of information, more code labs, videos about Compose in general, just to learn other topics. But specifically, uh, specifically about migration, we have a pretty comprehensive set of, of, of guides in our developer.android.com page. Uh, where here you can see adopting Compose in your app. You can see the table of content. But later down the page, you can see that you have pages for how to add Compose to your application, the different dependencies. Also a page for interoperability APIs. So today we've seen Compose View, Android View, Dimension Resources and all that, but there are much more that you can check out. And also some tip and tics, uh, tips and tricks of how to uh, interoperate and how to have Compose or how to add Compose to your existing architecture and existing UI. So previously I mentioned, you know, how to have Compose as the item of your recycle bill, and you can find all of that and more here in this documentation. So thanks a lot for coding along with us and have a great Android Dev Summit. Bye from us. Thank you. Bye.